many know that you have to be careful about those bumps in the road? And what I, what I mean by bumps in the road, I'm talking about those, those bumps in life. When you hit a bump in life that will cause you to be distracted from God and from his promises. One of the most amazing examples in the text, in my opinion, about someone who got distracted about the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God because of a bump in the road is the prophet Elijah. The Bible says that he comes, he came from, from obscurity out of nowhere. He just shows up and God uses him greatly. And during this one particular event that God used him, most of you know the story where God uh, told him to challenge the false prophets of Baal. And uh, he told the false prophets, you call on your God and I'll call on mine. And the God who answers by fire, let him be God. And most of us, we know the story. We know that Elijah called on God and God showed up. And he had a great victory and he, he slew all the false prophets of, of Baal. And after that great victory, he had a bump in the road. He got a word. Just a word. <laughs> I mean, you know, sometimes you can just get the wrong word. Just a word from Jezebel. And just threw him into a, into a, um, um, a change in terms of his direction with God. He just saw God answer by fire and kill up 450 false prophets of Baal. And he got one word, <laughs> one word. And it caused him to forget about all that God had done prior to that one word. And God had to restore him because he went into depression he went to a state in his thinking where he wanted to die now think about that he goes from being high seeing God move supernaturally on his behalf because of his word and then the next minute he's in this low where he wants to leave the earth and so he has this bump in the road and God has to come and restore him. I don't know about you, but I'm glad that we serve a God and I'm thankful that we have a God who's still able to restore. Are you thankful about a God who's in the restoration business? You know, it's, it's hard to be excited about the things of God. It's hard to be thankful about the things of God when you allow yourself to get distracted about his faithfulness, about his goodness, about his trustworthiness. See, life has a way of trying to distract us from who he is and what he's doing in our life. And when we allow ourselves to get distracted, the enemy comes in and he tries to work his agenda. And we know what his agenda is. The text is very clear about it. Jesus laid it out for us. We don't have to second guess. We don't have to get a word of the Lord what his agenda is. Jesus has already said that he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. That's his MO. But Jesus, he, he says, don't worry about that. I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And sometimes we forget about that. We forget that we serve a God who is well able and extremely capable of turning around any situation, any circumstance, and touch anybody at any time. <laughs> Heal anybody at any time. Save anybody at any time. Hello, somebody. Open a door at any time. Shut a door at any time. Touch a heart at any time. 
Hallelujah. And sometimes we can forget. And when we forget, it causes us to become ungrateful. David says in Psalms 23, verse 3, David says, he restores my soul. The word restore here indicates a process. The word restore was used in reference to a person who had broken a bone that needed to be reset. You know, normally when you break a bone in your physical body, the doctor is going to put a cast on that area so they can reset that area so that bone that had been broken can mend back together. And for those of you who have ever broken a bone, you know that that doesn't heal overnight. That restoration of that bone takes some time. Isn't that right? And so restoration takes some time. But how many know that God can restore anything broken in your life this morning? He can restore your finances. I don't care how messed up you may have um, allowed your finances to become. <laughs> I'm trying to find a nice way to put that. It doesn't matter how challenging your relationship may be this morning with your spouse. It doesn't matter. Um, what's going on with you and your, your children in terms of there being strife. But whatever is in your life that's broken, I mean, know that God is able to fix it, repair it, restore it back to the original state. How many believe that? But we have to allow ourselves to remember that he's able that he's capable, that he can do exceedingly abundantly above all that you might ask or think. Amen. He said, if you can think it, I can do it above that. Amen. But you have to remember who he is and what he can do in your life. Yeah. And sometimes we need to be restored. We need to be uh, restored back to that place so we can understand that he is able. Yeah. Amen, somebody. Some of us this morning, we are in a place right now where some things are broken in our lives. And it's hard for us to, to give him a thanks. It's hard for us to give him a praise. Because we're so consumed with the brokenness that's in our lives right now. But I'm here to tell you this morning that in spite of where you might find yourself, we serve a God that is more than able. Amen, somebody. He's more than able. Pastor Doug, why are, you, why are you saying that? I'm saying that because some of you are going to sit down with some turkey this week and you're going to be broken. And you're going to be worried. You're going to be stressed out. You're going to try to cover up your situation uh, you know, with a nice smile, with some, some makeup and some lipstick. And you know, a few jokes. You're going to be sitting there at the table with your family and with your loved ones, putting on a, a, a face. But deep down, you're hurt. And you're lost. And you're looking for answers. And the answer that you have, you have drifted away from that answer. How many know that Elijah, for a brief moment in his life, he drifted away from the one that had the answer? And I'm telling you, it's easy to drift away from God. It's easy to allow yourself to turn away from him when you hit a bump in the road. Over in the book of Joel, chapter 2, this book is called uh, the book of restoration. And I want to pull some principles out of this particular story because it applies to us this morning. The children of Israel, they have drifted away from God. They have drifted away from their relationship with God. And they are paying a healthy price for it. How many know that you pay a healthy price for drifting away from God? Come on, give him a praise, somebody. But watch what the text says. 
in uh, Joel chapter 2, verse 12 through verse 14. I'm reading out the NIV translation. And now the prophet Joel, he's, he's prophesying to the children of Israel the process of getting back to God in terms of their restoration. In terms of them getting back to where they need to be so God can move in their life. He says in verse 12, he says, even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and reaping and mourning. Verse 13, he says, rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And he relents from sending calamity. Verse 14, who knows? He may turn and have pity and leave behind a blessing. Mm, who knows? He may leave behind a blessing. What's going on here? What's happening is that the children of Israel, they have drifted away from God. And now God, when they drifted away from him, they allowed, they allowed a, a, a gap between them and God. And the enemy was able to get through the gap and come against them. How I many know that when you move away from God, when you drift away from God, you open that door so the enemy can get to you? Amen. Amen. And I'm telling you this morning, if you drift away from him, the enemy is going to take that opportunity to try to get you. And so the prophet Joel is telling the children of Israel, he says, I'm going to tell you how to get back to God. I'm going to show you the restoration process. And he tells them, he says, return to me with all of your heart. He says, the first thing that you need to do, Israel, if you want to get back to that place with God, where you were, he says, you had to go back to that place with God that you allowed yourself to drift away from. He's telling them, in essence, he's saying, I want you to repent. Now, Repentance means turning back to God. Repentance means renewing of fellowship. See, oftentimes when you talk about repentance, people think it's a bad word. You talk about repentance and people close off their heart and they think, well, you know, I'm good. But what you don't understand is that repentance means returning back to fellowship. Going back to that place where you started with God. Now, Repentance really means a renewing of fellowship. See, when I repent, I turn away from the direction in which I'm going. I go back the opposite way of where I come from. If I started with God, and if I want to end with God, then I got to make sure I stay with God. Amen, somebody. But all the times we start with God, and we, you know, life happens, right? Your life happens. You heard that you had a bumper sticker. Life happens. We start with the Lord and then we live life. And the next thing we know, we're not as close to him as we used to be. And because we pulled away from him or drifted away from him, there's a gap now between us and God and the enemy's using that space. So that space is space you're giving the enemy to work his agenda. Amen, somebody. Why? Because you allowed him now to get into that space and he's interfering with your fellowship with God. God said, if you repent and close up that gap, I'm going to show you something. Amen, somebody. Now, there's a big difference between relationship and fellowship. You, can, when we, you and I, when we accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, we came into or we entered into a covenant relationship with God. You and I, for those of you who accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you have a, 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 a binding, well, I don't know if I'm going to use the word binding, we have a legitimate covenant with a God. Amen? But having a, a covenant with God is different than having fellowship with God. Amen, somebody? So you can have, if, for those of you who are married, you entered into a covenant with your spouse. But some of you know that you can have a covenant with your spouse and one live upstairs and one live downstairs. Are y'all not talking to me this morning? You can have a covenant but not have fellowship. See, we have covenant for those of us who have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We have a covenant. 
but because we have drifted some of us we don't have fellowship amen somebody and this is what he's talking about he said I know you have a covenant with the Lord he said but you need to repent and get back in fellowship and some of us the enemy has been able to steal from us and he's been able to cause some brokenness in our lives because he's been able to get in there and, and hinder your fellowship with the Lord hello somebody see it, this thing is about heart it's a heart issue it's a heart issue it's not about church it's not about the building it, it's not about the, 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 the praise and worship team it's not about Pastor Doug it's not about Sunday morning you go to service and get it over with it's about fellowship it's about having a relationship with a God who your heart is right towards. Yeah. Just turn to your neighbor, just, just, just look at him, just tell him it's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. We are to love the Lord our God for all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our mind. Amen, somebody. Now, here's the principle. To get back what you lost, you had to go back to what you left. If you don't hear anything I said today, hear that. To get back what you lost, you got to go back to what you left. And this is what the prophet is telling the children of Israel. He's saying, you need to go back. You left God. My wife told me, I, I guess... I guess I, I'm going to say this. I was sitting right there. She said, you awfully far away. <laughs> she tapped me, said, you awfully far. I said, I, I ain't moved. That's the same chair I've always sat in. And that's what God's telling us this morning. Some of the things, you know, God is so far away. It's like, I don't, have, I don't sense him anymore. I don't, I don't feel him anymore. I, I, I'm not excited anymore. I'm not, I, I, it's like I'm not in that place with God where I used to be. Guess who moved? And guess who's calling you back to that place? Come on, give him a praise, somebody. Because here's the truth. You and I, we cannot leave the truth of God's word in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and not lose his presence. When we leave the truth of his word and when we lose the intimacy of the interaction of the Holy Spirit, we lose the presence of God. And the presence of God is more than just coming to church, reading a few scriptures, and lifting your hand on a few praise songs. No, it's having that relationship, that fellowship, that intimate fellowship with the Lord. And when you and I, when we allow the enemy to cause us to drift away, it costs us something. Amen, somebody. I'm not saying you're not going to heaven. I didn't say that. You, 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 you're heaven bound. I'm not saying it's a heaven and hell issue. I'm saying it's a fellowship issue. I'm saying if you want once again to feel the presence of God, you want to once again hear the voice of God, if you want to once again know that you're cloaked with his anointing, and you don't need no one to lay hands, you don't need no one to give you a word, you can praise him all by yourself because you know that he's with you. You can, you can go to church and not go to church, but you know, you, you know he, he's with you. Then you got to go back into fellowship. It's costly being out of fellowship with God. And here's the thing now. We have left the application of his word. What do I mean by that? We have allowed ourselves to get beyond the boundaries of scripture. When you leave, you heard me say this, I'm going to say it again, this is for the record. Anytime you have to leave the boundaries of scripture to get what you want, you're in the devil's territory. Amen. I might buy this CD myself. 
We have left sanctification. We have left sanctification. Sanctification where you, set up, where you allow yourself to be set apart for the use of God. You tell the devil, you're not using me for your agenda. You're not using any part of my physical body for your agenda. Or nothing that I have for your agenda. I've been sanctified. I've been set apart for the use of the Lord. We have, we have left devotional prayer. What do I mean by devotional prayer? Devotional prayer is just you and God. Amen, somebody. I thank God for the 530 prayer line. I'm, I'm on that prayer line every morning. I don't say nothing. They call out names, so-and-so on it, so-and-so on it, so-and-so on it. I got so-and-so, 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 so-and-so. And that's good. And that's, what we, that's the way it's supposed to be. But I recognize after the, having corporate prayer, I still got to enter into devotional prayer. But we left devotional prayer. Corporate prayer never substitute devotional prayer. Giving would never substitute for devotional prayer. Serving on the praise team would never substitute for devotional prayer. Preaching as a pastor would never substitute for devotional prayer. Prophesying and laying hands would never substitute for devotional prayer. Because devotional prayer is your intimate time with the Lord where you're talking to him and he's talking to you. Come on, give him a praise, somebody. We're left doing the work of the ministry. Ephesians 4 says that it's the fivefold ministry's job to equip the saints. For what class? For the perfecting of the saints and the what class? Oh, y'all don't want to participate. The work of the ministry. Work of the ministry. I was quiet. Not work for Pastor Doug, not work for Harvest Rain. Work for the kingdom of God. We're not just saved to look good, pray in tongues. That's a benefit. But God delivered us from darkness and he filled us with his Holy Spirit that we might be witnesses to walk in power of the Holy Ghost. Be a walking demonstration in the midst of darkness and let folks know you don't have to live like that. You don't have to take that. You don't have to uh, uh, scoop to that level. I'm telling you right now, you can walk in some power of the Holy Spirit. Be a walking witness. Any walking testimonies in the house? Hallelujah. I'm going to be off of this vein in a minute. Some of y'all feel real uncomfortable. I'm feeling you. It ain't on my notes, so I just got to get it out. You okay? God is good, isn't he? I'm telling you, he's an amazing God. He's incredible. The challenge that we have with the body of Christ, though, is that too many of God's people are living a low level of spirituality. A low level of spirituality what I like to refer to as a worldly level of spirituality. Paul makes it very clear, not Paul, but John makes it very clear over in 1 John 2, 15. He makes it very clear that there is something that is competing for our attention when it comes to our relationship with God. And he says in verse 15, he says, do not love the world or anything in the world. John says there's something competing for your attention when it comes to your relationship. He said, and it's the world. He says, don't love the world or anything in the world. 
Now, most believers, if not all believers, will simply say, I do not love the world. I love the Lord. Amen, somebody. But one of the ways that you, you know that you have gone too far over into the worldly side, away from the kingdom side, is when you allow the worldly side to make decisions for you. See, when something captures your affection and it controls your decisions, you love it. We're not to love anything that could come between us and the Lord. Now watch this. We can use the world. We can live in the world. We can benefit from the world. But don't you love it? Oh, you missed a good opportunity. Don't you love it? Don't you let the world make decisions for you? What does that mean, Pastor Doug? It simply means that the world and the culture goes one way and they make their decisions based on what they want, but then it's in direct conflict with the text itself. But we go outside of the boundaries of the text to make our decisions in line with the world. And then we say we love Jesus. I'm not saying you don't love Jesus. I'm just saying that your affection might be pulled a little bit more over to another direction. Let's turn to the person next to you until he's, he's talking directly to you. I got that out. You're supposed to help me. Now, now that we laid that foundation. Joel, he says to the children of Israel, he says, I'm going to give you four things that the Lord will restore back to you if you repent and close that gap. I love this. The prophet, he tells me, he says, if you repent and go back to that relationship, in which you started with the Lord. He says, I'm going to show you four things that he's going to do. And I'm telling you this morning, this is really relevant to us as a church in this hour. For those of us who have allowed ourselves unintentionally to drift away from the Lord. If you allow yourself to go back to that place where you started with him. These same principles apply to you this morning. He says in Joel chapter 2 verse 26, he says, you should eat the plenty and be satisfied. In other words, he says, if you close that gap and go back to the Lord, if you re re repent and go back to him, he says, God will give you plenty and there'll be no lack in your life. Amen. He says in verse 26 of chapter 2 of Joel, you should eat in plenty and be satisfied. He says, you will have plenty, you will be satisfied. Yeah. There's a reason why some saints are not satisfied financially. There's a reason why some saints, some saints are lacking in terms of their finances. There's a reason. Some of it's mismanagement, but some of it is because they are strayed away from the truth of God's word when it comes to finances. David says in Psalms 35 verse 27, he says, let the Lord be magnified, who has had pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. How many know that God gets pleasure in seeing us prosper? Now get a hold of that. David, he went on and said this. David said, you know what? I was young and now I'm old. Now this is David, King David. David said, I was a young man, but now I'm an old man. He said, I have never, I've never, as long as I walk the earth, I have never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. David said, I, I've been king of Israel. I've been hunted down by Saul. I took care of sheep, killed a lion and a bear, and Goliath. I went through a lot in my life. 
I've been a young man. Young when God anointed me, king of Israel. Old when I sat up on the throne of Israel. He said, I've never, I've never ever seen the righteous forsaken. Watch this. And this thing's generational. Nor their seed begging bread. You know why David could say that? They said, I've never strayed from the covenant of God. I've never walked away from his word. I never allowed there to be any, any gap, any air between what God says about his financial, uh, about his finances and me in terms of my giving. He said, I, I, never, I never allowed any space in between there. Yeah, God spoke it, I did it. God doesn't get lack out of any joy out of us uh, having lack. Amen. What kind of father would that be? It would be like me having joy because Brooks walk around here with no shoes on and holes all in her pants and a, and a, and a top and hair all dirty. It, this is Brooke and my daughter and I'm all dressed up. Looking good, smelling good. Here she comes, stinking, ain't washed. Hair are matted, ain't got nothing on. I'm not making fun of those who can't do any better. I'm just simply trying to give you a point or illustration that if you are the righteousness of God and if you are in line with scripture, the prophet Joel told Israel, he said, if you close that gap, if you get back to where you started from, if you go back to the one who gave you life, he said, he'll see to it that you have plenty. I know. He said, you should eat plenty. Watch this. And be satisfied. And be satisfied. Be satisfied. You know what it means to be satisfied in the Lord? It means for you to wake up every morning and say, Lord, I'm happy with my portion. I wake up every morning and say, Lord, I'm happy with my portion. I don't want Jake's. I don't want Dollars. I don't want Ripley's. I don't want the preacher down the street. I'm happy with my portion. Hallelujah. Satisfied. I, I, don't need, I don't need Deacon Antonio's. I don't need Deacon Lamont's. I don't need Elder Vernon's. I don't need Sister Yeah Yeah. God, I'm happy with my portion. That's what it means to be satisfied. See, guys, when you become that place where you're happy with your, satis with your, with your portion, you can be happy with other folks when God blesses them. See, when other folks get blessed, you got your nose turned up, you, you talking about them, that's because you're not happy with your portion. Come on, give him a praise, somebody. Prophet Joel told him, he said, if you get back, close that gap. He'll see to it that you have plenty. And you walk around, rock around satisfied. Come on, give him a praise, somebody. But then he says this, he said, if you repent and close that gap and go back, he says, he will restore your shout back. Some of you don't lost your shout. You don't lost your praise. You've lost your joy. He says in verse 26, and you should eat in plenty, be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God. He said, if you go back, you're going to be satisfied and you're going to get your shot back. Some of you this morning need to get your shot back. Come on, give him a praise, somebody. Come on, give him a praise. Now watch this. Be, 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 be David says, 
David says in, in, in Psalms 16, verse 7 and 9, NIV, NIV translation, David is instructing us, in essence, in terms of praise. He, he's telling us, in essence, we want this, this kind of praise. This is the kind of praise that we want. He says, I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. David says, this is the kind of praise that you want. You want a praise that will outlast your paycheck. You want a praise that will outlast a little dispute between you and a loved one. You want a praise that will outlast your car breaking down. You want a praise that will outlast what the doctor had to say. Come on, somebody. You want a praise that'll get past anything life can throw at you. In other words, you want a praise that'll get you past the bump in life. Come on, give him a praise, somebody. You don't want you, you don't want that kind of praise that a sort of life punch you between the eyes, you sad. Or you don't know if God's able. He's able before you got punched, and he's able after you got punched. Why? Because he's able. And your praise would dictate that. You let the enemy tell the enemy, you know what? Just throw your best shot, but you ain't getting my shout. You ain't getting my praise. Hallelujah. But then he says this. He says, if you repent and close that gap, he says, God will protect you and he will cover you and you will not be ashamed. He says in verse 26, and my people shall never be ashamed. He says, in essence, God will not allow the enemy to put guilt on you. Let me deal with this for just a moment, this, this guilt thing. David, he says in Psalms 38 verse 4, David says, my guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. James Dobson, I like his definition of guilt. I found this years ago and I stored it and I found it. I, I like his definition. James Dobson, he says, guilt is a message of disapproval from the conscience which says you should be ashamed of yourself. But how many know that for the righteous, feeling guilty is not God's plan for you? I said for those of us who serve the Lord, feeling guilty is not God's plan for you. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, 1, there's therefore no condemnation for them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. The enemy would try to put shame and guilt upon you because of choices you made in life. But the reality is we all make bad choices from time to time. We all have something in our lives, something in our closet that we want to make sure it stays in the closet. Amen, somebody. We all have something in our lives that we, we're glad God covers up. I mean, know the enemy will try to put guilt on you and put shame on you because you're learning to walk with the Lord. You're learning to apply scripture in your life. Let me tell you something right now. You keep applying scripture into your life. You keep making those choices according to scripture and when you do slip when you do fall you get back up you grab a hold of grace and you keep moving <laughs> hallelujah somebody Romans chapter 5 verse 8 to text us but God commanded his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us amen somebody the blood of Jesus will cover yesterday's mistake, today's mistake, 
and tomorrow's mistake. You just have to remember as a believer, as a, as a born again Christian, as you apply scripture, and as you walk this journey, that the blood of Jesus can cover the slack where you, you mess up. Now I'm not advocating sin. But what I am saying is, don't you allow the enemy to beat you up on any bad choices you made. And most importantly, don't you beat yourself up. What do you do, Pastor Doug? You go to God and say, Lord, I, I blew it. I, I blew it. It's not the devil. It's not brother so-and-so. I did it. If you confess your sin, my Bible tells me he's faithful in what, class? Just to forgive you of your cleansing and to cleanse you from what? All unrighteousness. The blood still works, somebody. Come on, give him a praise. I said the blood still works. But lastly, he says this. As I already bring this to a close. The lastly, he says, if we return Israel, he says, I'm going to restore the anointing and the power of my presence back into your life. If it's one thing that a lot of us could use is the power and the presence of God back in our relationship with him. He says in verse 28, he says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old man shall dream dreams. Your young man shall see visions. He says, if you get back to where you're supposed to be with me. He says, your children are going to prophesy. Your children are going to prophesy. Some of us this morning, we're just totally convinced that the devil has our kids. We're just totally convinced the devil, the devil has them. The devil has them. They're just making bad decisions. They just, they just, they just, I don't know. I didn't raise them that way. I just don't know what happened to them. Get your mouth off of them. Get your mouth off your kids. If you're going to speak anything over your children, speak the blessings of God. I don't care what mistakes they make or have made. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what, what they sound like. I'm trying to tell you this morning, if you stay within the boundaries of Scripture, your children should prophesy. That's a promise of the Lord. Now, whether your child is 16 or, or 66, they're still your child. He didn't, he didn't say what, when they're going to prophesy. He didn't, say, he didn't say they're going to be 16 and prophesy or they're going to be 86 and prophesy. He just said they're going to prophesy. What he said, if you get to stay in line with scripture, you will see once again the anointing and the power of God and the presence of God back in the life of your seed. Come on, somebody. Come on, give him a praise. Don't be cursing your seed be talking them down speak life into them speak the word of God over them and no matter what it looks like no matter what it sounds like you love them and you love them with an unconditional love if you can't love your children with an unconditional love how can you expect the father to love you with an unconditional love if the father can love you if he can love me then we in turn can love our own natural children with an unconditional love. He said, I'm telling you, if you go back and close that gap, I don't care what it looks like right now. I don't care what it looks like right now. Train them up in the way they should. When they get old, they should not depart. You don't go by what you see. You go by what you know.
to some of you being challenged this morning but you're looking at your seed you're looking at what's going on and I'm telling you this morning close that gap between you and your God I don't care what it look like brother Khan. I don't care what it look like I don't care what they sound like I don't care what they try to say your children should prophesy hallelujah here's what he says I'm closing it out he says if you return to me Israel if you return to me harvest rain he says I'll tell you what you have plenty not only will you have plenty you'll get your shot back not only will you get your shot back you'll have divine protection not only will you have divine protection but you'll see the anointing of God once again flowing in your life and in the life of your family come on let's give him a praise come on are you thankful for it I'm thankful that I have a God who's in the restoration business I'm thankful that I have a God who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I might think or ask I'm thankful that when I'm not able he's able I'm thankful that there's nothing too hard for the God that we serve is anybody thankful for Jehovah anybody thankful for the rock of ages hallelujah don't know about you I'm just grateful just grateful just grateful Pastor Jackson he's a good guy true to his word no matter what they say the promise is to you <laughs> hallelujah and so the promise because it's with you you don't want to have to stop it <laughs> come on give him a praise hallelujah Father, we bless you and we honor you this morning. Father, we thank you that you are a God of restoration and that you are more than able to restore anything that's broken in our lives. And so, Father, we maintain a grateful heart, a thankful heart for who you are in our lives. Now, Father, we recognize this morning that there may be some who are watching by way of media or who may be present who has never accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. But, Father, we also know from your word that it is your will, it is your desire that all men be saved and come into the saving grace of your Son, Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we are praying as a corporate body that you'll touch every heart listening to this message this morning. And that you would draw them by your spirit. If you're listening to me this morning by, by way of media, if you're present here this morning in the sanctuary, and you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I would like to lead you into this simple prayer of salvation and I'm going to ask that you repeat it after me everybody in the sanctuary repeat after me those in the media repeat after me say Heavenly Father I ask that you forgive me of all of my sins I truly believe that Jesus Christ is your son who suffered on the cross and died and on the third day, he was raised from the dead. 
and he's now seated at your right hand praying for me that I might have life and have it more abundantly Father I'm asking for Jesus Christ to come into my life to come into my heart and to be my personal Lord and Savior now Father by faith I believe that I am saved that I am born again and I thank you for it in Jesus name I pray amen come on give him a praise listen if you pray that prayer with us by way of media there's some information on the screen we want you to contact us let us know we'd like to celebrate with you amen if you're here in the sanctuary you pray that prayer with us just wave your hand at us and we'd like to get some information to you just wave at us if you're in the sanctuary you pray that prayer anyone amen all right well are you ready to worship the lord in your giving come on let's give the lord a praise you can be seated Deacon lamont's coming well, amen. Welcome to this offering time here at Harvest Rain Church. Um, for those that are watching online, we have three ways which you can give. You can mail it in, or you can use our text to give, or you can go to harvestrain.org. Amen. Well, amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. This is such a powerful time, such a powerful time. If, if you made it through 2021, we're at the end of 2021, and we've made it through the pandemic. If you're here today, you got something to be thankful for. Amen? Amen. Glory to God. Amen. And it's so good to see everyone since we, you know, come back into the building. Amen. Daniel? Man, amen. God bless you. Daniel, I, man, I'm happy to see you. You can ask Brooke. I ask about you all the time. And Brooke be like, call him. And I'm like, nah, he be busy. I don't want to, you know, stop his flow. Amen. And I see Angelica here. Amen. I'm calling you out. And she done brought boot thing. Amen. <laughs> Good to see y'all. Amen. I'm just, you know, I'm just waiting for the ski invite. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. Yeah, I used to ski. But y'all do a lot of East Coast skiing. See, I still kind of wedge. And East Coast skiing, it's a lot of ice on the ground. So, yeah, y'all move too fast. I like West Coast skiing. Where it's piled on the mountain, I can move slow. Amen. But just mention that, thinking about that, and just about skiing, it was right after the first time I went that I actually, um, that's when I had like my two discs ruptured in my back. My two upper discs, well, one of them ruptured and the other two were herniated. And so that year I had to go into surgery. Well, not surgery, but that was before I actually got up here. And, um, you know, it was just, when I came up here, it was around the same time around Thanksgiving. I had served in the praise team for, for a little bit, for, I would say, two years. And then everything started happening in my life. And I was just real young in this. And around Thanksgiving, it was around my birthday. We had just started 8.30 service at Harvest Rain. And it was the first service and they were coming to take my house so I was like wow so I had to get up and praise God two services first time we started two services so it was the next day someone called say hey we got a place for you to stay whatever and I know a lot of you remember sister Joyce they used to let us um, take a shower at their house um, around Thanksgiving and I thought about um, when they came and actually got the house we were packing our truck we had we had a little car we had our blue truck and we had the U-Haul truck and as we're packing the truck the people came and repossessed the, the truck all before my birthday so I said okay I remember passing recalling and she was just like, how's your birthday? I said, best one ever, best one ever. Because I made up in my mind that no matter what, I was going to keep praising God. They could take everything else, but they can't take my praise. So they took the house. We, we rented a house. We were renting a house. And um, 
it's Thanksgiving and Coach Barnes that used to go here, um, him and Prophetess Barnes, they opened up their home to let us have Thanksgiving dinner with us that year with the Georgia State basketball team. And so we went home and got a knock on the door. It was Sister Frances that used to go here, her and her husband, um, Brother Sean. And they came from the food pantry and they just had a box of food for us on Thanksgiving. And I'm like, okay. So at the same time, fast forward to December, I find out I gotta have surgery. Brother Tinga, Sister Tinga, they're taking me to the doctor, you know, making sure I'm getting my checkups and everything on my back, but saying, yeah, you gotta have the surgery. And so I was out of work for a long, I was out of work for a long time at that period because my back kind of was re-aggravated. And um, I never forget, two days before Christmas, I got a check from my job for $1,800, unscheduled. Unscheduled, I wasn't supposed to get paid. That blessing came right before Christmas. And that was the year it snowed on Christmas. I just went back in the backyard, I started weeping. I, I just, I couldn't control it. Had the surgery, put two titanium rods in my back, you know, whatever. And I remember the hardest thing when I woke up from that was I woke up to somebody next to me screaming. They couldn't move their fingers. They couldn't move their, their, their toes. So the first thing I'm doing is, okay, I'm good. I'm good, right? So the hardest thing was to walk. And I never knew my body was in shock. I never knew how I was after surgery trying to walk. You know, just walking all, you know, and I had the brace and the whole deal. And we were getting ready to come into this building. And um, I just remember just being thankful, just being thankful just to walk. I mean, we had the, 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 the Daniel fast. I, I was able to do that even in a hospital. But just in a, in, in a roundabout way, everything that just came about, and there's so many other testimonies around this time. Um, going with Sister Brianna's son, um, being able to pass out turkeys when we used to do that. Um, 2017, around this time, moving into my new house, seven years later from the time that they repossessed my house. And what I want to tell you, the, the, the scripture that I want to read is Psalms 100. And it says, a song of praise and joy. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. And this is the scripture I want to focus on. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and unto his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and is true and to all generations. And I say that today just to say, I don't know your story. Only you know your story. Each and every one of you. But you know that God has been good to you. And if you can think of anything that God has done for you, you ought to give him some praise. You ought to give him the glory. Amen. So I don't know what the Lord has, has told you, but trust the Lord. Trust the Lord, whatever number that he has given you. I mean, it's amazing. The number of my home is 555. And when God brought it to me, he was like, that's my grace. That is the number of grace. God, no matter what you're going through, and that meant so much to me what you said, Pastor Doug, no matter what you're going through, God is able to restore, he's able to renew, he's able to refresh, hallelujah, he is able to transform your life. So today, trust in the Lord, get a seed in your hand, amen, and give it to the Lord, amen, hallelujah. Is everyone giving that has a chance to give? Amen. Glory to God. Amen.
We serve an amazing and awesome God. Hallelujah. He is a God of restoration. He is a God of new beginnings. I just believe that if there's something that you need from the Lord, give, sow, trust God, trust God. He is faithful to his word. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Is everyone giving? Amen. God bless. Stretch your hands towards the offering. Amen. Most gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for these offerings. We thank you, Lord God, that this represents the heart of your people, Lord God. Father, we thank you, Lord God, that as they give, Lord God, that they're giving obediently, they're giving not grudgingly or necessity, for Lord, you love a cheerful giver. They're giving cheerfully unto you, Lord God, trusting, believing in your word, Lord God, knowing that your word is yea and amen. Father, we thank you that your word is settled in heaven. So, Father, today, Lord God, as your people give their seeds today, Lord God, whatever need, Lord God, that they have, Lord God, Father, restore, Lord God. Father, we pray blessings, Lord God, upon each and every family, Lord God, upon each and every home, Lord God. We just thank you for the faithfulness of your people, and we thank you that your work shall continue in this house. You have been so faithful to Harvest Rain Church and to his people. But Father, we just thank you, Lord God, for this new season that is coming up in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you, Lord God, as we give thanks unto you, Lord God. We give praise unto you. We give you honor. We give you glory today, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for the manifold gifts, Lord God, and the blessings that you have bestowed upon your people. So, Father, we give this to you, Lord God. And we thank you, Lord God. We know, Lord God, that you have blessed us, Lord God, to be a blessing, Lord God, to others, Lord God. That you have given us the ability, Lord God, to get wealth, Lord God. So we thank you, Lord God, for overflow, for increase, for abundance, Lord God, for breakthrough, Lord God, for miracle signs and wonders, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for restoration, for peace, and for joy. Father, we give you praise. We give you all the honor. We give you all the glory. And it's in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus that we pray. Amen, amen, and amen.